So, uh, we planned a panel discussion, which is a, bit, a little bit hard because there's no panel. So the panelists have to be standing, which makes sure that it's short. <laughs> so, what I wanted people to talk about, and it's not only about the panelists, the panelists are there to get something, uh, to get the discussion going. I want you to be involved. So the topic is real-time safety and mainline Linux, where are we heading? And is this really the, a viable, a feasible solution? Are we on the right track doing this? And where are the limitations we are currently running into? I let Nicola start with that. Okay, so um, the approach is actually almost trivial, as usual. Um, safety standards assume that we have a process and the process emits code. Process also emits documentation and bugs and a few other things. But the assumption is that um, if we have a well-structured process, then we have a tolerable level of residual bugs. So the question in the context of functional safety standards is can we assess the Linux kernel development process so that we have reasonable confidence that uh, residual bugs are in a tolerable range? That is the question, what is a tolerable range? Okay, um, well, basically, what you, when you're talking about tolerable ranges um, for random faults, it's trivial. We can enumerate that and say SIL2 is 10 to the minus 7 critical failures per hour. Um, it's a range, not exact number, but that's not so important. For systematic faults like bugs, we can't really say that. Um, but we can come up with some things like if Thomas writes code and Peter reviews the code, then the probability that it's better after the review is gr greater than zero. And if we do enough such cycles, um, then we can achieve an equivalent code, equivalent to the state of the art for managed development. I don't know if there's a chalkboard here, because then I can put that in one simple diagram. Do you have some chalk? Yeah. yeah. Chalk is coming. Okay. Here? Yeah. Okay, goody. So it's very simple. Normally we have a process like SPICE or CMMI, and that produces some code. And this code has a, a process-based uh, reviews, audits, testing, analysis, whatnot, and you get some um, initial increase and then ideally decrease of bugs. And at some point you're saying the residual bugs in there are in a tolerable range. Um, and we put our life on these systems in air airplanes, trains, ships, and whatnot. And in the open source case, we have some process here, but we don't really know what this process is and how good it is, but we can measure this part. Of course, it's much better. <laughs> yeah? And that's basically the approach we're taking. The bad news is that um, for the Linux kernel, we can do this. For some of the out-of-tree patches, it's a little bit painful, and one of the painful patch series is currently Prempt RT um, because all our nice little statistical exercises don't work with that patch set due to traceability limitations, uh, due to um, the inability to trace it back in history when it was introduced in all cases, why it was introduced, so root cause analysis, severity of bugs is currently a little bit hard to do with the Prempt RT, and also the we static. We don't want to make it too easy for you. Uh, I, I was assuming that that's by design. That was my assumption always. Um, 
And the second uh, side of the coin is, of course, the static code checking. Now, I understand that uh, there's a new CI framework in the work that will help improve that. Um, static code checking, of course, will be an important thing. Uh, you might now think, well, uh, why is testing not being mentioned? And I would estimate that if we all sit down and test the hell out of this um, RT preempt patch set, we could probably cover 10 to the minus 67 percent of the state space that a Linux kernel can achieve, and that's why it's simply not relevant. So the argument for safety is the process, not testing. Testing and prototyping is nice. It shows you that what you want to have is there, but it gives you absolutely no clue that what you don't want is not there. And the only way to do that is to assess the process. So we need to find ways how we can improve the preempt RT process. Of course, mainlining is one of the key issues. Um, how we can improve this process so that we can actually um, come up with reasonable arguments for why it's in the tolerable range. Can I get this one? Yeah. Okay, so given this the open question in this regard, so we as Siemens currently do not really bet on one solution, we bet on many. Um, so we are looking very interested in the approach to certify the kernel to make it uh, usable for, for safety critical applications. Um, but we're also looking into having an option for a partition system, which is a much smaller kernel, so to say, with a hypervisor approach. Um, and we are also looking into different approaches regarding real time. So we are both running preempt.t as well as Xenoma in products. Um, so simply, there are many open questions. If you have to build some system out of this and have to come up with a solution eventually, um, it's a bit like probably like the, the question, what is the drive system for the car in the future? Um, if you bet on one, you may bet on the wrong one. After 10 years, it's painful. So it's pretty hard to bet on one solution or one approach in this regard. So what, what is the limita limiting factor right now in terms of going with the simple partition uh, stuff? I mean, this should be accessible, this should be easy to put in the process. Yeah, so we actually went um, with um, half of the documents, so to say, or not even half, uh, a friction of the approach to the TIFF and ask about um, if it is a feasible approach. And the TIFF said, well, the software looks uh, good and it's probably doable. We can do a white box assessment on this. Um, but we need more regarding the hardware. Um, and that's actually currently the open, the open aspects because a hypervisor relies heavily on properties of the hardware to achieve the isolation. And that means that we need information about how is the hardware working, what we can rely on, where are the potential errors, how we can uh, address them in software, or if we can't address them, but other approaches are needed. And that's currently the open question. Could you move over? Camera, she's yeah. oh, there. You're sorry. not covered by the camera. I'm not coming. <laughs> yep. So to maybe put that in uh, another description, the code Jan's talking about from um, the jailhouse project is extremely small. And basically, the strategy is quite brilliant for safety. The strategy is try to do nothing in software. Um, so basically, at runtime, the hypervisor ideally is doing almost nothing because it's only special partitioning. Um, the problem is it's actually not doing much other than configuring the hardware. So the problem is sort of delegated to assessing the hardware. And from what we understand from hardware vendors, currently um, anything that's as complex as an IOMMU or so, there is no, not even a reasonable strategy how to certify these things at the moment. So that's the showstopper at this point. I've heard that a number of times, and if you can't certify an IOMMU, I don't know how you certify a CPU with an, I, with an MMU. You know, it, it's as complex and more. No, IOMMUs are fundamentally more complex. Uh, we, we, we've 
built both. And I, our hardware guys don't think one is fundamentally more complex than the other. Okay, do you have a complete specification for an IOMU that we can go to TIFF with? The, the, there are multiple ways to do IO MMUs. Yeah, but the one that you did, do you have a formal specification or reasonably complete specification? Well, where's the formal specification for the MMU and the CPU? Well, there's two, two answers to that. One is we have a different historic background for MMUs. So put simple, if I claim that uh, take a single core, say a Pentium M, and claim that the MMU is not total rubbish, they will accept that. If I go to them with a new chip and say the IOMU is perfect, it might be hard to argue. Okay, so you, you're saying because of the lack of historical record, you can't count on the IOMMU. That's the most reasonable argument for the difference I've heard so far. Also, also <clears throat> just not non-standardization. I mean, IOMMUs for different um, uh, CPUs have fundamentally different behavior. Um, MMUs for different CPUs, except for set associativity and maybe um, some replacement algorithms, they're well understood, they're well known. Uh, it's not really a complex configuration behind it either. How many registers do you need to configure the MMU? How many do you need have for you the IOMU? Have seen the SMMU V3 spec? Yeah, there's a lot of registers there, but... <laughs> there, there is, but it, uh, still, it's it's a different level of complexity. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think the historical record argument is probably the strongest for why nobody's ready to trust an IOMMU today. But so, if this is the case, if you can't trust the hardware with a little tiny bit of software on top of it, how are they going to trust the same hardware with a whole bunch of software on top of it? That's actually easier okay. because, um, okay, uh, it, it's, it's not our argument, but this is just a, a rough um, representation of, of the, the problem. If I take a highly complex operating system, how many instructions is a hello world in assembler from hitting enter, enter until you have hello world on the screen, just roughly? 50K, so 100K? You're arguing percentage residual bugs is easier to hit in a large code base. The probability that it survives and does something false positive, saying everything's fine, producing a valid output and ask, actually it's totally um, total garbage is much lower in a complex system than is a simple system. And so it's, in, in German we call that the thousand Gummiwurzel hypothese. Yeah? If there is if a pointer, a straight pointer, were to um, uh, occur in the kernel, the probability of this thing actually surviving and producing reasonable output from then on is reasonably low. So in a certain way, highly complex systems can be simpler to certify than simple systems. Yeah, it's just really hard for me to correlate this. So I, 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 I completely agree with you that the standards say it's all about the process. But then when we get practical advice from people that have gone through the process before, it's about, well, you can't have any dynamic memory allocation. You have to justify no. every use of dynamic no. memory no. allocation. No. 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 You have to... Wrong standard. Uh, That's a problem. They're all using the wrong standards. They're using the standard for low complexity systems because that's what they were used to. You well, I, I understand that, the, the, that there's a big disconnect today between the complexity of the system that we need to certify and what they're used to certifying. Right. But right now, on the partition system, we're, we're, we're trying to do a, a small code base, 10 to 20K lines of code, to partition, and then, and then, an, and then a very small, again, a, a 10 to 20K application for the safety critical part. Yes, but... The, the problem is that we rely on the isolation features of the partitioning. Yes. And that's the hard to prove point. Are these partitioning features really re reliable or not? And we can't assess that at all. 
we need the, the help from, from the chip manufacturer for that. And okay. what so we have seen so far... Virtualization, just use the kernel. Yeah, what we have seen okay. so far in terms of uh, safety manuals for that kind of chips, it's close to fairy tale books. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem where we are running into right now. And as, of course, there is no, no actual huge use of, of uh, or precedence of SMP systems in safety critical. So, but now we are hitting with various use cases like autonomous driving, robotics, and whatever. You hit the, the barrier where you actually need the computing power of a PC or something equivalent. And on the other hand, you have the safety requirements because you don't want to run over somebody or crash the car or whatever. Right. So this is where we run into, the, into that gap. And we need both uh, the same ideas about how to tackle that on the, on, the, on the application level. This is not yet a solved problem. How to s assess and certify applications in, at that complexity level. Yes. But then we have this extra bottom piece of the hardware which needs to be highly complex, more complex than what's used in safety critical systems right now. So and we need that information. Can we rely on that, on that piece of hardware or not? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the authorities will say, yeah, if you do crystal ball assessment, good luck with that. Yes, but the, why can we do why can we do it um, complex software? We can't do complex hardware. That was one of your questions. Well, and I think I got the answer when Thomas was talking. You're not relying on you're using the kernel to own more of the the hardware data flow. Right. So you're not relying on the IOM and, and you you're relying on user kernel separation. Right. And the the key difference here is that if we rely on the hardware, we have sort of a single level of protection. Right. In the kernel, I can use C groups, SecComp, uh, diversity, MMU, whatnot. I can use multiple layers of isolation. And this allows us to build up arguments where we have, well, we know C group is not bug free, but we know SecComp is not bug free, and we know the MMU code is not bug free, and the process environment is not bug free. But what's the probability that a uh, pointer in application A violates all of these protection layers and actually can impact application B? So we can use multiple layers of protection analysis to um, mitigate some of the uncertainties. And the key difference here is it's managed uncertainty as soon as we're in the software level where we have the design flexibility that we don't have in the hardware. Yeah, but without the hardware level protection as well, you have to concern yourselves with an active attacker and the safety aspects as well. But we're not looking at security at this point. Well, and, and the standards don't yeah. either. The standards don't either, but when you, if you're talking this far out, right, I think that where we're disagreeing is what time horizon we're looking at. I'm looking at a year or two years out. I think you're looking five years out. Uh, no, not five, it's, um, 10, 10, 15 okay. years. 10, 15 years. Before. Yes, I mean, if we, if we you don't have absolutely to... need a, the complexity of, of a Linux system to get your job done, then you're going to have to find a solution to this problem. Right, and if you don't have that complexity, don't use it. Act, actually, so if you ask a certain part of the industry, they want to have do that tomorrow. Uh, they are advertising it for five years that they can do it tomorrow, which is hilarious, but that's a different story. Uh, so, but actually the need for this complexity is, is there today because they have today to build the systems they want to run in maybe when the job is done. I mean, that's well, even less predictable than preempt RT. Exactly. The standards catch up with us. We're doing. We're going. We're going to ignore the standard and, and keep going. Right. They have to finally sit down on their butt and write the standard. That's their job. 
what are they waiting for? That's our problem. We are taking standards that were written in the 1990s and saying, we're going to use this for autonomous driving, which is yeah. uh, just wrong. But and the consequence must be that industry sits down and says, we need complex OS, we need AI, we need C++ and other horrible languages. So we have to find out ways to certify it. But right. they're not doing that. Right. Well, it was written in the 90s for a 1970 coding style. That's when it was. But yeah, before <laughs> 1970, it's hardware. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if you're really trying to solve the autonomous automotive problem, then you have to look at this level, right? I'm looking at problems that are partitionable today and, and, and how can we get, how can we solve the problems today? And, and most of the, the, the application itself that needs to be that safety certified is not as complex as you know, the machine learning and all that sort of stuff, but does require more than a, car, a Cortex-M to run. Okay, so you're gonna buy one generation of products by doing that, but you're not gonna get much further. Yeah, but, but still, if you look at, at it, let's, let's say in the context of jailhouse, then we still have to have a reasonable certainty, certainty that the, the partitioning we provide in, or we set up in software is actually provided by the hardware. And it's something we can't access without having the information from the chip vendors. Well, I don't know if you have more information than other chip vendors, but I've seen nothing so far which holds up to the, to the job, or Jan. We are waiting eagerly for this. <laughs> well, well, first, come, the first yep. comes out with such a thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the design is, uh, of Jailhouse is to, to cater all kinds of architectures. Um, well, not all kinds, but the majority only on the market. So basically, it leaves the, the, the ground open for any vendor to jump in and, and provide a solution which is certifiable and set the pace for this. It would be very interesting to see. And if none of them do it, then we still can try to go for diversity um, and argue away the hardware by having a... ARM64 in parallel with the x86-64, in parallel with a MIP-64, just yeah, the last one just for the fun. That's what we have done well, before. Independently sourced machine learning algorithms. So the training has to be diversity sourced. Uh, machine learning is not solved, we know that. I'm just trying to get the software stack up to glibc, cer certified on complex architectures. And how the funny bunnies from the AI department are going to do it, nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other questions to that? So, my question is, Jan, is yeah. <clears throat> so I've always been told 10 to 20K lines of code can get certified. 20K lines of code is going to take a year to get certified. And what is your experience? My personal experience is not in this area, actually. Okay. <laughs> so I've only participated a little bit in, partic in, in certifying uh, a Linux kernel once, a long time ago, for a specific purpose, with a very specific approach. Um, probably not really repeatable in this form. Um, but um, yeah, I guess this, the dimension you mentioned is actually what we are heading for. And maybe you can even get smaller, uh, at least with uh, the real critical part to be uh, going through the full process. Um, but yeah, so it's really, if, if this can be done um, in software with reasonable effort, I guess this is the, the software approach for this. Otherwise, you really have to go for the complexity, as Nicholas mentioned, and go complete different paths. Yeah, I mean, the, the diversity solution is well known and well established, but of course, if you think about mass production, then the bean counters will hate you for mentioning it, even mentioning it, because they won't, I mean, they are clever enough to, that they figured out by now that there's this single chip which can do all the things fr from the computing power perspective. So they want to have this single chip doing all the things, including the safety stuff. So that's, that's why they are looking into that because they want to save the extra x86 MIPS diversity problem with all the extra costs. Extra room, extra heat. There we go. 
Uh, one thing about the jailhouse solution I might add is I personally looked at the code a little bit and I do think that it is in a complexity class where you actually could argue it as a low complexity system from the code. Um, low complexity in 61508 is defined as a piece of software where all failure modes are known and behavior under failure is understood. Now, um, at least for the core part of Jailhouse, that's probably doable. And if it can be um, brought down to low complexity, then the software problem for Jailhouse is almost trivial. Um, the hardware, of course, is an open issue. Any more questions related to real-time safety? And heading, are we heading into the right direction? Uh, so when you're talking about adding layers and layers for security or safety reasons, um, you would assume that Linux or that hypervisor is the only system that has full control over, well, the ECU, the hardware. What's when there, let's say, in two other CPUs that are not controlled by the hypervisor but are on the same bus, uh, have access to the whole IOMU to everything else, um, and there runs a proprietary or just some custom code on there. So how is the certification for this whole system? Actually, this is not possible. So this is well known and understood by the hardware. This is already understood by the hardware vendor, uh, at least by a particular one. Um, if it's going to be realized is a good question. Uh, but yeah, this is part of the system. It's part of the system, it has impact. Um, which impact may not be really completely understood yet by all of us, or maybe by some people. Um, but for a safety critical system, I absolutely agree. That is not possible, and we have to be worked on. But there are multiple architectures on the market, and others may have different properties. Maybe favorable ones, maybe not. So that's the advantage that you can move around and see which is the best shop for this problem. Wrong crowd, but proprietary isn't isn't the uh, the problem. Um, it's it is, if it's proprietary, but written by the manufacturer um, for that second device, then you know that's that's okay for them. Um, well, the uh, it, there are many people that go to go to certifications with closed source solutions. They, they have to share them with the auditor. Um, but they don't have to share them with the world. Um, it's, it's true. And, and today, on, on automotive, you know, anybody that can get to the CAM bus, th that is also a multi-processor bus where you can do things you probably shouldn't be able to do. <clears throat> yeah, of course, it's not the topic about proprietary versus free software at this point, from a, from a safety point of view. Uh, it has to be assessed as well. And the question is if this code has been written according to the standards, according to the processes that we need to apply. And there is code in, involved in the setup and the startup of a system which hasn't been written according to this on typical machines or in today. So that means that everything is involved and all the complexity you have in these additional chips have to be compliant and compliantly developed. And that may be a, a huge amount of software, maybe even larger than what we are currently talking about here. I mean, maybe the, the, the question that's implicitly be, uh, might be behind this is, why are we looking at Linux now? And the key issue here is that the traditional operating systems were by process developed for single core systems, um, all the major vendors. And as the Linux kernel proved in the 2.2 series of kernels, it is not quite that trivial to switch from a single core to multi-core. And the assumption that you can now take these traditional safe operating systems and dump them on the multi-core um, is, I would say, a little bit naive. Um, they're going to try and do it. It's probably not going to work. Um, and of course, the security properties also will not be able to be brought into that. And I think these two changes are what sort of reopened this kind of worms for industry.
Any more questions? Everybody tired by now? So, I want to thank you for participating in that discussion. I hope we can come up with better news next year. Maybe the wake-up call to the hardware manufacturer works. And you go home to your company and you come back with something which is not a fairy tale book. Would be appreciated. <laughs> and so I hand over to Michael for the final instructions for the rest of the evening. <laughs>